Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. With the entry of Romania and Bulgaria this January, the European Union now stands at 27 members. Each successive expansion of European Union membership has contributed to a strengthened European identity and a bolder voice for the Union. There is one potential accession to the European Union that raises a number of challenging issues, that of Bosnia-Herzegovina. With its recent history of violent conflict and an intricate, delicate accord preserving the peace, democracy and minority rights are still fragile concepts. Meeting European Union standards will not be easy. At the same time, the European Union faces a challenge of its own, to use the accession process with enough diplomatic imagination to encourage, rather than frustrate, Bosnia's progress to internal harmony and integration into Europe. My guest is Nida Jelagis, a program associate with the East European Studies Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Nida, welcome to Dialogue. It's a delight to have you here, and it's a very important question. I'd say a critically important question, both for Bosnia and for the European Union. And Nita, I think to get us underway, we have to understand a little bit about the succession process. It's been called um, the most successful foreign policy the European Union has because it imposes obligation, but it confers benefits as well. And a key word to understand how this operates, well, there's several, but the first one might be conditionality. What does that mean, and what does it mean specifically in terms of Bosnia-Herzegovina? Conditionality is simply referring to that process of uh, conferring benefits after a country has, has done what the EU has asked. So mm. basically, it's, you know, you'll get this if you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, it's quite a simple concept. But uh, the benefits of European Union membership have been seen as so, as so, uh, so good that, uh, that countries have been willing to, to take, out, take input from the outside of their country mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to, to make changes rather right. than simply looking at what's happening within the country. So it's quite new in that sense. But what precisely might that mean in terms of Bosnia-Herzegovina? What would the concerns uh, as you know them be in terms of what they have to do? In Bosnia, the, uh, the task is much more difficult. In, uh, in when you compare the countries of post-communist of the post-communist space that have become members in the last few years, uh, they already had a, a, a stable state right, in many cases, right. a functioning constitutional system in many cases, and and a, a clear desire to be democratic mm -hmm. and and to and to become part of Europe, mm -hmm. in that sense, in the political, international, legal sense. Uh, in Bosnia, it's just so much more difficult because mm -hmm. the, the Dayton Peace Accord had created a system in which the fighting ended, and it was it was pragmatically based, uh, so that each so that none of the three sides had more power over right. the other, and that doesn't uh, it, it creates peace, but it doesn't create state unity. Um, and in addition, they had to they they left an international presence there in the form of the Office of the High Representative. Which uh, which also has veto power, mm. for instance, over over what the the national uh, governors uh, decide, and and the power to dismiss elected officials, and so basically it's an outside governing force, which right. questions the 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 sovereignty of the state, whether that quite, that, that state has sovereignty. Uh, once again, uh, Nita, that's a marvelously uh, helpful answer because it, you know it, it occurs to me that as opposed to uh, the states that entered previously. Um, they were sort of built states. We have a, 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 a state in process, a state building project underway, right. which makes it extremely complicated. You use the word constitution, and that strikes me also as kind of interesting in both sides of the question. Um, to take the EU right now, with France and the Netherlands objecting, the EU's constitutional status is, is up in the air in a sense. And I take it from you that that also, in a sense, is true of Bosnia, that there is at least uh, a work in progress. Right. I mean, in the, the European Union, each member state country, I mean, has, uh, if not a constitution, uh, a clear and stable rule of law system right. in place. And that's what's missing in Bosnia. The fact that the, the European Union, as a super state, has, uh, has, has had some trouble with it adopting the new treaty. Mm -hmm. I mean, they gave it the name the con of a constitution, right. but it's basically the same treaty structure that has been building over the last uh, uh. 10 years or so. 
but the each country has its own governing structure that holds uh, that can can uh, accept a super state uh, uh, a legal structure from the EU. But Bosnia doesn't even have the capacity to govern itself independently. Mm. And adding another level of, of of law will just it'll go to nothing because nobody no there is no ability, there's no capacity of the state to implement right. that, those laws that are coming from above, from the EU. You so know, I, I don't want to make this sound like mission impossible, but these are, <laughs> these are pretty daunting hurdles right. to get over. And there's another one too, Ned, as, as though matters were not complex enough, and that is mm -hmm. the European Union's own appetite for growth. I mean, it seems to me it has changed even the last few years. Right. In 2004, we had that big group come in of East European countries. And now it looks like a lot of Europe, well, the French and Dutch attitudes prove this, are questioning the whole virtue of expansion, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think there, there seems to be a lot of consensus mm -hmm. in the European Union that at least the countries of the former Yugoslavia ah. should, should be taken in. And there, there is clear agreement that this, this is something that ought to be done, right. um, a, as opposed to considering Ukraine or Moldova mm -hmm. or, or looking further afield. Uh, that's, that, will, that will come into question. I think a lot, of the, a lot of the resistance comes from the fact that it all did happen quite quickly. Exactly. And there, the, the EU has had a longstanding problem in its adoption of the new constitution to uh, for example, to 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 tell its citizens what the EU is and what it yeah. means, because it's a complex uh, organization at a level of of international law that not many people are are well equipped to to, to sort of accept. So that's a brilliant point, quite frankly, because I, if I can project myself as a quote average Frenchman or or um, average uh, European of any kind, it would seem to me these are strikingly new concepts to digest at once and threatening too because you have labor pools and different economies now mixing into the same pot with you know the and and you know pro the prospect of jobs shifting to different places all that can be very frightening I would Absolutely. think another aspect of this Nita, that I'd love to get your opinion on is and I think you've, you've touched on this um, the constitution of Bosnia Herzegovina itself now one of the things about all this conditionality we've been talking about, it seems to me it, it puts an onus on the executive of Bosnia-Herzegovina to deal with these issues. The, my question to you is, what does it do the legislature and the legislature's ability to construct the kind of constitution and laws that are needed? I mean, are they part of the process? Are they themselves at sea? What's your sense? They, it should be a, government, a, gov a full government effort. Mm -hmm. uh, in looking at the countries that have exceeded since, uh, since 2003 mm -hmm. in post-communist Europe, uh, th these countries had to, what happened was that all the political parties seemed to have gotten together on the fact that this is a, this is a, a goal that all parties can agree on. Right. So that once, once they established that, that EU enlargement is going to be the, the major goal of the country, Parties were able to cooperate both in the legislature and within the government, mm -hmm. uh, and and governments. Uh, the, the, I think they they work in tandem, depending mm -hmm. on the constitutional structure of the individual country. But in most cases, there was there was basically a tacit agreement that this is what we need to, mm -hmm. this is what we want to do, and there were debates. Uh, within the government and with the legislature of how to get that right, done. Right, but that it was a common bigger... sense that this is where we want to go. Exactly, exactly. But is that true in Bosnia? No, that's the, that's the problem. There, there are bigger issues of, of state cohesion at place there, uh -huh. and, and there are other issues that need to have, have taken precedence there. I think there is, among the, the population, a, a feeling that we want to become part of the European Union. Right. But uh, the problem is that because the international community has still a voice in Bosnian politics mm -hmm. through the office of the high representative, the, the country isn't itself completely dependent on itself to get these reforms passed. And this makes, this makes it all the more difficult where there is a situation in which the international community is partially responsible for the reforms in Bosnia. Yeah. And until you get uh, rid of the office of the high representative and make sure that Bosnia stands on its own two feet and adopts these reforms itself, there, there can be no sort of progress towards yeah. this, but then you're in a catch-22 because without the office of the high representative, the the different parties in in Bosnia don't don't want to don't mm -hmm. seem to want to cooperate at this point. Yeah, I want I want to come back to that office of the high representative and this whole question of international involvement. Uh, it's it's a very interesting history. It was very necessary, obviously, to bring peace, but maybe it creates its own problems. And well, you know, in fact, uh, well, this is my next question. That maybe one of the problems is part of the peace. I mean, the Dayton Peace Accord itself is the document that, as its name suggests, brought peace 
to, uh, to the area, to, to Bosnia. But in an ironic kind of way, isn't this also an obstacle? In other words, might there be a need to renegotiate the peace accord itself and some of its provisions? It's so ethnically based mm -hmm. that that war is against the European ideal of there not being. Precisely. I mean, the, 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 the elements that were strung together, sort mm -hmm. of the theoretical elements to string together the Dayton Peace Accord were, were, were not based on some sort of single ideology or some sort of grand strategy for state building. It was simply the, the big the big goal at that point was mm -hmm. simply to end the fighting. And in order to do so, they, they created a system that doesn't, uh, doesn't protect minority rights to the mm -hmm. fullest extent and is, in fact, the antithesis of, of minority rights. If you, if you consider that, uh, that you vote by your ethnicity, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that, uh, I mean, in our country, we don't, need to, we don't need to divulge our ethnicity or our political party necessarily. We can, we can choose not to do that. But there you do have to, you do have to choose basically a side mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and identify yourself through this ethnicity. And it's only by identifying yourself through this ethnicity that you have citizens' rights, mm -hmm. which is problematic. So if you are not part of these three major groups, you, your, your rights are limited. And this, if you think of the European Union structure, uh, this is a very important thing, and this is why uh, in, the, in the conditions for accession you need to show, a country must show that they protect minority rights. Because right. the idea is if you want to create a, an open market for labor and goods, uh, that just because you're not Spanish and you go to Spain and work, you should have all the same rights that a Spaniard would have yeah. if you're Finnish, for instance. Well, so. you know, that's, that's an extremely helpful answer, Nita, because you know, it shows you how um, a virtue, you know, something designed to stop something awful, can also prove to be problematic because uh, ethnic rights can work against minority rights, what we're talking about here. Since we, you know, everything seems to be uh, so problematic, I almost hate to ask this question, <laughs> but if Dayton is, is, is reopened, and I think it almost has to be in a sense, um, what is your sense of, is that like opening Pandora's box? or? Are things going to uh, fall apart, or in some ways it is. I mean, the, there is already a constitution in place, but it's insufficient for uh, to create a functioning centralized state mm -hmm. in in the country. That is sort of a uh, seems to be a prerequisite for EU accession. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are basically two ways to go about uh, changing this this federal or this you know centralized state structure. And one is that. Right, you revamp, you completely ditch uh, the Dayton Peace Accord, and you start from scratch. You start a constitution drafting right. stra from scratch, and the other one is to build on what is already there. Mm. Uh, and this is the, these are sort of two options that, um, and I think that it seems like the latter is more uh, more probable mm -hmm. in, in in the time frame that everybody's trying to push this yeah, forward. Which, uh, well, that's another point. Time frames can vary in accession, can't they? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. they can they can be what they have to be right. or need to be. Um, an interesting thing also, and that I've heard this, I don't know if it's true or not, that there have been some attitudinal shifts about Dayton over this, the past decade. In other words, um, um, Bosnian Serbs are now much, strong, much more pro Absolutely. than they were, because they were originally very anti. This right, whole thing. because this, this preserves their, yeah. it preserves Republika Srpska as an independent entity of, of Bosnia, yeah. and that's something that, that that, uh, that now they're they're in full support of, yeah. so that there is, and that's the thing. I think the reason the reason to avoid, at least formally, saying that we need to get rid of the Dayton Accord is because there is a significant mm -hmm. attachment to to that process. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think the 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 stress should be that it's the process of Dayton that we should be. Uh, give our allegiance mm. to rather than the document. Right, and I think that's right. where the international community should come in and say, okay, that began us on a process towards something else. Yeah. And we, we don't need to, you know, these, these documents are not enshrined, but the mm -hmm. process should be, that's what we ought to follow. Speaking of the international community, precisely because you mentioned it and because of something you said earlier about the Office of the High, uh, high Representative being preserved. That was Lord Patty Ashdown. Is it still? It, it, no, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's since he's left. Been, mm -hmm, he's since left and he was replaced by uh, Christian Schwartz Schilling, who has now resigned and he will soon be replaced by uh, Mr. Lychek from, the, from Slovakia. So and and do these progressive appointments mean it's being extended, the Office of the High Representative? The idea last <coughs> summer was that the Office of the High Representative would be closed by June 1st this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in the earlier part of this year, there was a decision was made that, uh, that 
it, it was in a sort of politics in Bosnia became completely intractable and that they would extend mm. for one more year mm -hmm. with a new appointment as, as the higher presenter. Well, how does that impact the accession process? Because you've got these outside helpful, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but certainly outside still. It's, uh, it's, I think it slows it down, uh, mm -hmm. once again, because the, the idea is that a country needs to show mm -hmm. that it is a, a self-sustained democ democracy that can implement and adopt uh, this, all these regulations that are, that are part of the European legal structure mm -hmm. and, and implement them. And, and if, you, if you can't do it by yourself, then, then yeah. that, that raises the question of who, who's doing it. You want it to be sustainable, a sustained system of democracy and, and, and law and, and rule of law. And if there's always an outside force mm -hmm. doing it, there, there's the question. I would, yeah, I would think sovereignty. that's true. I would just human nature being what it is. Right. Um, you know, if, if we waved a magic wand and sort of asked the Bosnian Herzegovine population in general their sense of the desirability of European integration, I mean, opposing it is either or. You know, either you become a member of the European Union, hence a stronger member of the European community, or some very dramatically say you risk ghettoization, mm -hmm. um, being completely left out, a backwater basically. That's probably overdramatic, but what would your sense of the, the public attitude for this be? Can, can you build a political consensus in our American terms for this? I think, you, I think that there is a political consensus there, but I think what the country now lacks is leadership mm. in order to bring those, that consensus together. The idea that uh, the country is still split by, by ethnicity mm -hmm. uh, and each has their own political parties and political leaders mm -hmm. they don't get there's no there's no one bringing all of those sides together in this one common goal but that's 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 a fascinating topic you don't see any um, you know anyone on a in shining armor coming forth being above all else a bosnian right I, it's 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 a question that would be it would be nice to see that but we haven't seen it yet that would be wonderful to see it i think here's something that um, uh, I'll, I'll just put my cards on the table. It'll be wonderful for me to see, but I don't know if it's going to happen. And that is, there are some old ghosts that haunt this process. Uh, as, as I understand it, the European Union is not going to accept any of this unless, and these are names from the late and very ugly past, Radovan Karadzic, mm -hmm. Karadzic and Ratko Mladic are brought to justice. Now, first of all, if, is that true? I think, I believe it is true. And what's the prospects for that? The, uh, the what is true is that the country needs to show a clear cooperation with the International Criminal Court for the mm -hmm. uh, for Yugoslavia, the ICTY, and uh, until it shows that it's cooperating, it it won't move forward in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I think, that at this point the the cooperation has been mixed. I, I think it's starting to go to that that mm -hmm. uh, that that they are cooperating, but it's a difficult task as well. And mm -hmm. they the the question is between. Uh, Bosnia and Serbia, who who has more power to to bring these people to justice, and I think there is a bit of a there is a bit of um, a, a pushing off a responsibility to to either country. But do I take it from what you say, Nita, that uh, the European community or the European Union at this point, maybe just at this point, would be um, is interested in a display of goodwill? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The the idea there has been a lot of criticism of of he keeping the ICTY in or keeping the ICTY in this process uh, because it seems like uh, it's it's a little bit too much to ask at this point but I think what the it's it makes sense legally if you consider the fact that this is something that this is an international legal system in which Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia have all signed on to and if they can't uh, implement and work together in this international legal structure they won't be able to do it mm -hmm. in the European Union. So it's sort of a test case for future future right. performance. And I think for that reason it wouldn't be wise to to scrap it at this point in, in the EU accession process. Right. You have to give it a chance that you have to mm -hmm. show that I mean Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have to show that they are willing to work through these international legal structures mm -hmm. and they, they believe in them because that's the that's the essence of the European Union. Well Neta, since we speak here of the essence of the European Union and giving people and nations a chance, here's your chance mm -hmm. to help us understand how what you think uh, the principles of a and and accession processes as I understand them thanks to you can be tailor made to mm -hmm. situations. What what could be done? I mean how would you think the European Union, just in the briefest of terms, can design the process so that it works for everyone's 
best interests. Right. Well, I think at this point uh, they need to they need to focus on the 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 primary issue here is is in state building at this point and this is something that they didn't have to do with other post communist countries that was so in this sense it's not it's not going to be eu enlargement as usual it's not going to be imposing a new a, a, the same template in a new area this is an untested these are the eu is in uncharted waters in this mm -hmm. case this is something new for them and but i think that without that step uh, and without the help of the united states government mm -hmm. which is still still holds quite a bit of influence in the country. Mm -hmm. You can't move forward. So the first focus is constitutional reform. Make sure that this is a unified country that has the capacity in its central government to, to make those reforms that are necessary for EU accession and implement everything that they need to do. So mm -hmm. that should be the first step. Rather than, um, I mean, what, what the, the enlargement process is basically adopting 80,000 pages of, of, of directives from the European Union. So mm -hmm. it's adopting legal standards into your, into your domestic legislation. Is this and the famous acquis communautaire? I want exactly. to use that word at some point. <laughs> acquis communautaire, everyone. That's, this is the body of European law, Exactly, that all of the directives from, from, that the EU has, mm -hmm. has adopted and that need to be uh, uh, integrated into your legal system, into the country's legal system. And this is difficult. And without, if, if you start with, you know, okay, let's look at education reform and we'll start there. Mm -hmm. You can't do that without first beginning at the, at the constitutional level, that you need to create mm -hmm. a clear legal framework a queer rule of law framework from which to from which right. to begin this process. So that would be the first thing that that's the do. first thing, and I don't know even to call this the second thing or not. But it seems to me that it's right up there. And that's of course the minority rights question. Mm -hmm. Now, do you propose that's tackled through the constitutional reform, or is it simultaneously addressed in some other form or fashion? I think I've been thinking about this and uh, in in trying to figure out ways of convincing the people in Bosnia that mm -hmm. this is the way to go forward. Uh, the, the interesting thing about minority rights uh, in, in the EU accession process mm -hmm. is that minority rights is, even though it's sort of, it's, it's stated as a clear condition for, uh, for enlargement, mm -hmm. there is no standard within mm -hmm. the European Union of minority rights. Uh, because it's contentious, it's difficult to, to decide between countries what sort of state we want to build, um, and it goes at the essence of, of individual nation sovereignty. You know, what what kind of people will we accept? Who, right. who won't we accept? And and what kind of state we want? What kind of nation we want to build? So it's it's so contentious that it, within those eighty thousand pages of the Acute Communitaire, minority rights doesn't come up once, mm. and yet we we use it as a condition for, for accession. And because there there is no clear standard, European standard for minority rights protection, the ability for the European Union to, to affect change in, in post-communist East European states has been rather limited. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been non-existent, but it's been limited to some degree. In the case of Bosnia, the most of the main in instruments, international legal instruments for minority rights protection have already been adopted because it was the international community that adopted them, essentially. Right. Uh, but if we, one way to move forward in both directions in, in, pro in promoting minority rights and constitutional reform is to say to the Bosnians, your constitution as it now stands doesn't comply with the international mi minority rights norms that you also are a party to. Okay. And this might be a way to begin that dialogue towards mm -hmm. making changes, making constitutional changes. A couple of questions. Uh, first of all, just independent of Bosnia almost, do you think Europe needs a debate on minority rights? It's had a, it's had a debate on minority rights mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the idea with the European Union in, in general was that after we integrate economically, we'll integrate politically as well. Mm -hmm. But the political integration is much more difficult because these these are issues that are very close to and dear to, to people's hearts. The the French don't want to give up their their you know the the, the concept of French citizenship, mm -hmm. which is so important there uh, in order and, and by giving by giving rights to certain, different rights to different groups that mm -hmm. just for, for the French destroys their concept of citizenry and equality of the citizenry. And you know, to me, it suggested that, I remember when the whole glowing prospect of European political unity was waved around like a big flag. I don't think that's, I mean, it sounds like that's very uh, dubious. Because mm -hmm. you're not, uh, everyone's gonna have a, their own sense of how these things should operate. Right, right, and it's difficult even within a country to, to make those changes, let alone between between nations. Now, if you tell, and the second part of your end, if you tell the Bosnians that you've got to make your minority rights consistent with the, the international standard, do you then, I'm just think, trying to think of this strategically, 
get them to do that or hope they'll do that and then expand it into things like specific areas education housing and I mean right across mm -hmm. the that's absolutely the way it I think because that that will, what we have the kind of government structure we have in Bosnia right now is basically parallel institutions mm -hmm. for each for each minority or I'm sorry each ethnic group so you have three hospitals in a state in the city mm -hmm. you have three different schools depending on each and this evening the idea is that if we if we start to create a Bosnian citizenry rather than an ethnicity ethnic based rights you you can begin to bring those those places those those people together because at this point it's been it's been more than 10 years of of separate schools and segregation mm -hmm. we know from our country isn't isn't the way to sort of build mm -hmm. a unified community and a unified state so if we if we begin to 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 look at the legal issues that are that are affecting this outcome, we can we can begin to hopefully see see a more a unified Bosnia at the end. One reason I love talking about international affairs is you can always learn something about yourself. Absolutely, when you do it, and you know, and, and that's a wonderful point. I mean, that we we should never look complacently or condescendingly on anyone's situation. We're all part of the same drama, but this whole business of being extolling a citizenry rather than ethnicity is very important mm -hmm. to build to build a country. Um, and in terms of building a country, just our time is. Unfortunately, running down. But just just as a brief uh, sentence, uh, Nita, if we were to get up from this table and go to Bosnia right now, what would we see? Would uh, would it be a hopeful prospect from your visits, or one that we should be? I think there are spots of hopefulness, and I think that when I think of what has happened in what how how the region of post-communist Eastern Europe has transformed, I think it would be nice for Bosnians to to see that that footage, for instance, if it existed, of how things have changed, to give them more hope that they can change it in their country as well. It's a wonderful answer. It's been a wonderful conversation, Thank Nita. Thank you very much. We'll have you back. Thank <laughs> you so much. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue's also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week and thank you for watching this week. Yeah, you are wonderful. That's right. <laughs> that was great. Absolutely.